Yes, cool. Thank you. Uh, our uh, next uh, uh, two speakers are uh, uh, the most uh, juniors, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm very proud to introduce the first one, who is my graduating student, uh, Carlos uh, Esteves. Uh, he has done a lot of uh, work uh, on spherical uh, uh, CNNs, uh, including uh, uh, several oral presentations in the main conferences. But today he will present a also very new result on spin-weighted spherical CNNs. And we see the slide. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for, uh, for inviting me. And let's get started. So today I'll talk about networks equivalent to the continuous group of rotations, uh, the group SO3. There are many applications for these models, uh, and I'm showing two, two examples here. The first is for 3D shape analysis, and the second is for spherical data analysis. In both domains, uh, the inputs can come in any orientation, and this motivates the study of uh, equivalent representations uh, in this group. Now here's the outline. We'll begin with a review of non-commutative harmonic analysis from compact groups, and we'll show how we use it to compute convolutions on groups and homogeneous spaces. This gives rise to two types of spherical CNNs. We'll introduce them and discuss their limitations. I'll then describe the spin-weighted spherical functions that we use to overcome those limitations. And finally, introduce our spin-weighted spherical CNNs and show some results. We begin with some theory. First, let's define group representations. A group representation maps group elements to linear maps on a vector space. The example here shows the group of unitary complex numbers and its representation as rotations on the plane. Representations will show up in Fourier analysis on groups. Now recall the expansion Fourier series of a periodic function which can be seen as a function on the circle. The transform is an expansion in a basis for functions on the circle given by the complex exponentials. Thanks to the peter weyl theorem, we can generalize the Fourier series to compact groups. The basis is formed by matrix elements of group representations, and we arrange the Fourier coefficients as matrices. Now recall the convolution theorem, which says that convolution corresponds to multiplication in the spectral domain. The same expression applies for compact groups, but now the coefficients are matrices. This is key for efficient computation of group convolutions, and group convolutions are the way to achieve equivalence to a group. We also need Fourier transforms and convolutions on homogeneous spaces. A homogeneous space is a space where the group acts transitively. This means that for any two points in the space, there is a group action that moves one to the other. Homogeneous spaces are the natural domain of features of a group equivalent neural network. For example, the sphere is a homogeneous space of the rotation group SO3. And it turns out that the Fourier analysis on groups extends to homogeneous spaces. The coefficients are matrices with the same dimensions, but with some sparsity patterns. And we can apply the convolution theorem in the same way. Note that the output may be a function on the group or on another homogeneous space. Now let's specialize these results to the group SO3. The representations are odd dimensional square matrices indexed by the degree L. This means that functions on SO3 can be expanded in a basis formed by the matrix elements. Here, F hat denotes the set of Fourier coefficients of F and we can arrange them in the same shape as the representations. Now the spectrum of the convolution between functions on SO3 can be computed by multiplying the corresponding matrices at each degree. As we have seen, the free analysis of compact groups extends to its homogeneous spaces by considering a sparse spectrum. So the sphere is a homogeneous space of SO3, and in this case, the sparsity manifests with a single non-zero column per degree. The restriction of the SO3 matrix elements to this sparsity pattern results in the spherical harmonic spaces. And functions on the sphere can be expanded in this basis with a spherical Fourier transform. Now the spectrum of the convolution between functions on the sphere can be computed by multiplying the corresponding sparse matrix at each degree. Note that the same sparsity pattern appears in the output, so the output is also a function on the sphere. Now let's look closely at the computation for a single degree. 
Note that only one coefficient of the filter spectrum per degree is actually used. So the spherical convolution can always be rewritten with a sparser uh, filter spectrum, with only a single coefficient per degree. In the spatial domain, this constraint corresponds to zonal spherical functions. These are constant at each latitude and result in isotropic filters, uh, which have limited expressivity. And this convolution is the main operation of our previous spherical CNNs, which we call purely spherical because all filters and feature maps are on the sphere. Now recall the spherical convolution we just discussed. Our related operation is the spherical cross correlation, which replaces the filter spectrum, but it's conjugate transpose. Note that in this case, the output is no longer has the same sparsity patterns as the inputs. The output can be in fact a function of the group SO3. This is used in Taco Cohen's spherical CNNs. The first layer is a spherical correlation that lifts the spherical inputs to the group SO3. And all following, following features and, and, filter, and, and filters are on, on the group and not on the sphere. So the disadvantage of this approach is that the group has more dimensions than the homogeneous space, so that increases the computational cost. Now this table summarizes the two types of spherical CNNs discussed. Our main goal now is to design a spherical CNN that is both efficient and expressive. Our solution is based on spin-weighted spherical functions. They are introduced in physics to study gravitational waves. These are complex valued functions on the sphere whose phase changes with rotation. First, we show a standard function on the sphere that corresponds to spin zero. Notice how the magnitude and the phase only move to another position upon rotation. Now, when the spin weight is non zero, the phase also changes depending on the rotation angle and the spin weight. Now, similarly to the standard case, there's a basis for these functions, and it's called the spin weighted spherical harmonics basis. Now, there's an extra parameter S per basis element that indicates the spin weight. Again, for spin weight zero, we recover the standard spherical harmonics. The key to our approach is that the spin-weighted basis elements are related to the columns of the SO3 representations. Each spin is associated to one column. Now we define filters and, and feature maps of our network as sets of spin-weighted spherical functions of different spin weights. Now recall the standard spherical convolution where we have effectively only one filter coefficient per degree. With the spin-weighted functions, we have multiple spins, which are related to different columns. Now we use this observation to define the spin-weighted convolution. In this example, we have spin weights zero and one. This results in more expressive filters with four filter coefficients per degree. And this is what it looks like in the spatial domain. The spin zero component is a standard spherical function with, which we represent with colors. Note how the filter is no longer isotropic we show the spin one component as a vector field. Now this highlights another advantage of our method. It can handle spherical vector fields, uh, which previous spherical CNNs could not. We can see that the convolution that we just defined is equivalent as a vector field. Now we clarify the differences between scalar and vector field equivalence here. This is how a scalar field on the sphere rotates. The RGB channels move independently to another position on the sphere upon rotation. Now imagine we have a vector field on the sphere. We cannot treat it the same way as a scalar field because the vector, the vector should also follow the rotation of the base space. Now the proper rotation of a spherical vector field involves moving the vectors, then rotating them. With this, we can have our more expressive features and also represent vector quantities. Now we follow the spin spherical harmonic transforms implementations from Huffenberger. It has some interesting tricks for efficiency, including an extension from sphere to torus to leverage 2G, 2D FFTs. And we follow the same idea to localize the filters by interpolating the spectrum as in our previous spherical CNNs. But there we only had spin zero and order zero components, and now we can have any spin and order. So we, we have more uh, coefficients. 
And finally, uh, we must adapt the batch norm and nonlinearity to work with complex features. We make them operate only on the magnitudes. Now let's talk about computational complexity. The spin-weighted spherical Fourier transform that we implement here is the order of B cubed, where B is the bandwidth. Uh, and this is between uh, the performance of both previous models. So what we're proposing here strikes an excellent balance between computational costs and ex expressivity. Uh, before showing results, uh, let's see some prior work uh, on CNNs for vector fields. Cohen and Welling and Marcos et al. show equivalent vector field processing on the plane. And still on the plane, the harmonic networks also use complex numbers that can represent vectors. It's similar in spirit to our method. And Weiler et al. extended this terrible CNNs to 3D, but on Euclidean space. So we are one of the first to consider equivalent vector fields on the sphere. So the gauge equivariance CNNs could also be used to achieve equivariance in the vector field sense on the sphere. And then the major difference with respect to our method is that our convolutions are computed spectrally. All right, here are our results for the spherical MNIST introduced by Cohen et al. We show here three modes based on whether the training or the test set is rotated. Our spin-weighted spherical CNNs are in blue and they show better performance for all modes. Now we introduce a spherical vector field data set to study uh, vector field equivalence. It is based on MNIST and the vectors come from image gradients that we map to the sphere. So the first task on this data set is classification. Even though the original spherical CNNs are equivalent to SO3, they are not equivalent in the vector field sense so they cannot generalize vector field rotations. So the spin weighted networks do a much better on the rotated modes. And we also run dense predictions tasks. The first is to predict an image from an input vector field on the sphere. We set each target digit to a different color. Now the ground truth and our outputs are on the right. And here are the numbers for this experiment. The spin weighted networks do much better on the rotated modes. We can also predict a vector field from a spherical image. We add an angular offset based on the category. Note how the other methods cannot predict the vector's orientations consistently. And here are the numbers. Again, our performance is much better. Now these here are really fresh results, uh, finished uh, a couple hours ago. Uh, we apply our model to real data on semantic segmentation of spherical panoramas. This is an upright data set, so non-equivalent models also do well. Equivalent representations can still be useful here since there's parameter sharing happening at the local level. Now, when the global orientation is useful for the task, we can break equivalence after some layers to make use of it, giving a boost in performance. And finally, our model can equivalent handle uh, the surface normals. So taking them as an extra input also helps. Now to conclude, uh, this model strikes the balance between expressivity and computational efficiency. It is strictly more expressive than the azotropic spherical CNNs and it's more efficient than the SO3 based spherical CNNs. So we can have uh, bigger networks and achieving better performance. It's also one of the first equivalent models uh, for equivalent vector fields. We're currently working to apply it to 3D shape analysis, but there are many more scientific applications to be explored. Thank you all for the attention. Uh, for more details, please check out our paper on archive and check my website for related work and codes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Carlos. Uh, might be you can mention how much is the saving in the number of uh, coefficients uh, in the last example for the semantic segmentation when you use an equivariant network? Uh, the number of parameters? Yes. Uh, we can, I think with one quarter of the parameters of the, the unstructured grids, uh, we can achieve similar performance. You mean here, right? 
Yeah, but note that this is this data set is upright. So the the conventional models also do well. So we're not rotating things here. So if we start rotating the, the inputs, then our, our the difference in performance must be much uh, much larger. Thank you very much, Carlos. We 